first conviction integrity unit and the first crime strategies unit in New York City. He's also the co-creator of Operation Clean Slate, a warrant forgiveness program that began in 2015 and has been replicated in jurisdictions across the United States. This effort later evolved into four of the five boroughs of Manhattan, vacating summons warrants of 10 years or older. Since July 2017, this initiative has led to the dismissal of over 240,000 warrants with another 460,000 warrants in its sights. DA Vance is co-founder and co-chair of Prosecutors Against Gun Violence, an independent nonpartisan coalition of prosecutors from major jurisdictions across the country. He's taken a national leadership role in addressing the issue of race in the criminal justice system, including commissioning a study by the Vera Institute of Justice to evaluate his office's practices related to bail, charging, and plea bargaining. Mr. Vance has made significant series of investments in transformative criminal justice initiatives in New York and nationally, reducing the number of individuals with mental and behavioral health issues in the criminal justice system and piloting educational programs in New York State prisons. While enhancing his office's capacity to bring New York City's crime rates to historic lows, DA Vance has focused resources on community-based alternatives to prosecution and incarceration. And he works to spread these policies and initiatives and innovations that reduce both crime and harm across the United States through his partnership with John Jay College of Criminal Justice in an initiative that I am very proud to be part of, the Institute for Innovation in Prosecution. And with this, I welcome District Attorney Cyrus Vance to the podium. Thank you. Meg, thank you so much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to be at John Jay, really. Uh, John Jay is an essential, first of all, it's an amazing civic institution uh, for the city of New York and uh, an amazing academic institution uh, whose mission, I think, fits perfectly with the challenges that we face today uh, in law enforcement in our, in our communities in New York. But uh, it's, uh, it's always been a great partnership. Uh, and uh, Carol, thank you so much for your help. Uh, I had a great working relationship with Jeremy Travis, and I, I look forward to just as good or better a relationship with you. I want to welcome and thank the other panelists who have come from around the country to uh, share your, uh, your practices, your policies, your thoughts on this changing world of, uh, of the role of a prosecutor. Uh, and Meg, thank you for being the director, executive director of our Institute for Innovation and Prosecution which we started with John Jay about a year and a half ago. It's funded by forfeiture dollars our office has received in prosecution of large bank and financial fraud cases. But what a great opportunity we felt to uh, have a major city district attorney's office like ours in Manhattan partner with a major academic and research institution like John Jay, focusing on the long view for prosecution strategies and best practices. It's, it's a, uh, I thought it was a, an amazing opportunity and I'm so pleased that we're we started and that we are uh, on the way. So my opportunity and my pleasure today is to talk with you a little bit about the changing role of the prosecutor uh, as, as I've seen it and as we're trying to frame it uh, in New York City and in Manhattan. And I will tell you that uh, this clearly for all of us has been a, uh, a very, very changing, powerful, uh, head-lifting moment of the last several years. Uh, for me, myself as a prosecutor, uh, I see, obviously, I see that the administration, for example, that had previously been a major funder of support to uh, economically disadvantaged communities, for example, uh, moving away from that kind of support. So that has big implications for a city like New York. Uh, and I see that on issues of race, and we all see, and we've seen it, reading it in the, in the papers, and it's at the top of all of our minds, certainly over the last several years, that America... Uh, is focused on race and criminal justice, and uh, who is in the justice system, why, how did it get that way? And one thing that really moved me that I just want to share with you before I get into the work that we've done is the, what I saw when I came into the court in Manhattan 35 years ago when I was a young assistant district attorney in the Manhattan DA's office in 1982. And I remember being sent down to nighttime arraignments. We used to work the court shifts from 1 a.m. to 9 a.m. 
It's called the lobster shift. And you couldn't be struck but by the fact that 90% of the men and women who were coming in as defendants in court on those hours were men and women of color. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, uh, it's just so obvious that you have to ask yourself exactly how is this happening. I left the office after six years, but what was most remarkable to me and what was driving my thinking, uh, which I'll talk about, is when I came back to the DA's office 35 years later uh, to lead it in 2010, and I went down to arraignment. Hours had shifted. We'd eliminated overnight arraignments. What did I see? I saw 90% of the men and women in court coming through court, men and women of color. How was it possible that over 35 years that the same picture would present itself in this courthouse with so much that has been done and so much that we've learned in America and in our justice system in the intervening 35 years? So my challenge, first and foremost, well, first as DA, uh, the fundamental challenge is you focus on public safety, on the streets, against violent crime, against uh, sp special and vulnerable victims, against terrorism, and against economic crime. And you strive for a justice system, and my job is to make a justice system more fair. But when I came in and was reacting to the picture that I saw in the courtroom that hadn't changed in this many years, I made a decision that at least one of the things that we were going to focus on as a first step towards redefining uh, the role of a prosecutor, at least as I foresaw it, was to look at our offices, uh, look at our office from a racial bias perspective. This was 2009. I committed that when I came in, I would do what is called a what we called a racial bias analysis uh, of the Manhattan DA's office. And we brought in Vera, uh, the great think tank that's based here in New York, to essentially do a statistical analysis. And they took three years. They looked at hundreds of thousands of cases, did analysis, met with scores of our assistants. And it was really a, a, a long, in-depth project. And at the end of that project, Vera issued a report. The report is on Vera's website. It's on our office's website. And the report indicated that there were areas uh, in our practice focusing on bail, plea bargaining, uh, sentencing recommendations, and charging decisions. There were some statistically significant differences between otherwise similarly situated people, between whites, Hispanic, African American, and Asian. Uh, and people ask me, actually, why are you doing this? I mean, it, it, I don't think there had been a DA's office that had invited an academic institution like that to do this kind of study. And this, what I said was, I am much more concerned about not knowing information that can inform us on the issue of race in, our, in, our, in the DA's office than I am uh, about trying to not know it at all and just pretend it's not there. So that study sent me in the direction of focusing on, on uh, issues of race uh, and how we handle race as prosecutors in our office as a first step. But the Vera report was actually much more important to me, and it's leading to it what I think Meg would like me to talk about today, is a real real thinking with the, with, the, with the backdrop of race and fairness behind us, is how do we make decisions about who should be coming into this criminal justice system? What is it that we can do to be more thoughtful and achieve just as good public safety result, results and be more fair? The statistic that hit me the most from Vera's report was that the NYPD would bring us cases, a wide range of cases, and we would actually bring in to the courts room, because we would write up the cases, charge people, bring them into court, 96% of the time that the police brought in complaints. It's a very high percentage. And having been a defense lawyer for the 20 years before I came back to being a district attorney, I had a sense that there was a big area there where we could make real strides, both against achieving a fairer justice system, a more, uh, a more equally uh, approached justice system, uh, by focusing on low-level offenders uh, and, not, and low level and uh, uh, those with uh, insignificant criminal records, and try to rethink how we handle those cases. But let me just tell you the backdrop is our criminal court system in Manhattan was overloaded. We had 100,000 cases a year. 85% of those cases came in criminal court. I have great respect for the criminal court judges, but they were overwhelmed. There were inadequate resources to provide in meaningful interventions for the young men and women who were coming in who were arrested. And I thought that really where we needed to make progress and where we could is in criminal court reform on issues of race and fairness. So the first thing that we do was to start uh, programs that would provide alternatives 
for individuals who otherwise would have been arrested to be diverted. Diversion programs, and many of you in this audience are familiar with them, probably some of you work with them. Uh, but we started first in East Harlem, which was our highest violent, violent precinct at the time, and we focused on 16 and 17 year old boys and girls. And that program called Project Reset started some years ago, and uh, that program went on as a pilot project for, for some time. We've now moved it to all ages and all throughout Manhattan. So if you are someone who has a minor criminal record uh, and uh, you have a minor offense, uh, the goal now is, as opposed to arrest and processing through the criminal process, to explore diversion at the precinct as opposed to uh, the opposite. Now, the youth diversion, Project Reset, uh, Nitin Savor, I don't think is here, but he runs our criminal court. It's actually been very successful. Uh, the overwhelming percentage of uh, young men and women who've gone into it uh, have, have gone through the program and succeeded. I think it's 94%. The re-arrest rate is quite low. And so that gave me what I think it gave me the foundation that I knew I should be focusing upon to prove that even though people, uh, uh, many people want to harden our law enforcement efforts on what we call quality of life offenses, that actually if we were more thoughtful about how we handle those quality of life offenses, we could achieve better outcomes for the young men and women and keep our communities just as safe, if not safer. So we expanded uh, Project Reset to the entire county for all ages. Uh, we've moved on to uh, uh, working with the police department very effectively in, uh, in having them whether there's, when someone has a summons, uh, is found with a warrant for a summons, uh, that that can be immediately taken care of in court rather than that individual having to be processed and put through cuffs. Uh, as, as Meg said, uh, working with the PD, we have gone back uh, 20 years uh, and we have dismissed open summons warrants uh, for that time period uh, for individuals who haven't been in trouble. Now that's 240 cases, 240,000 cases for Manhattan. But the goal in all of these is to try to, at a larger level, uh, a more volume level, uh, try to rethink our decisions on who comes into the justice system. Our office has been very fortunate because we have funds through our, through our uh, bank financing cases and prosecutions to be able to fund many of these initiatives. Uh, and it's enabled us to fund, for example, pretrial release. How do we keep young men and women out of custody pending a trial uh, in the hope that we can find a resolution that may be short of trial or a conviction. So we have the opportunity to fund those kinds of programs also, the desire being let's keep kids particularly out of the system and let's try to find a pathway forward for them to succeed. And most recently, as, as Meg uh, mentioned, uh, actually it's 10 years old, I'm sorry, the summons, the, the, uh, the theft of services, uh, the summons initiative is those cases that were 10 years or older with open summons, not 20 years or older. And with theft of services, um, we, dis we made a decision that uh, theft of services is the largest arrest number in Manhattan, 10,000 cases roughly a year. And it became my belief, based upon the strong guidance and help I was getting from my staff, that we could also take that population and we could seek working with the police to divert many of those folks in lieu of having them arrested. You know, you can drive down the West Side Highway in Manhattan at 70 miles an hour and you'll get a speeding ticket. Uh, and the speeding ticket will take you to a speeding court where you pay your ticket. But if you jump a turnstile in Central, in, in, in Central, Grand Central, uh, you can be arrested, have cuffs put on you, and go to jail. Those don't seem proportionate responses uh, to, to the conduct at issue. So what we're really trying to find is, uh, it's not as if misconduct should be ignored. I don't think it should. But the consequence for that misconduct should be proportional. And the example of speeding in a car, having a, a ticket that you pay at a, at a license at a courthouse versus getting arrested for a theft of services is an example. So what has this meant for us in terms, of, uh, in terms of our office's work and what has it done for our office? First of all, it's enabled us in the last four years to reduce the number of incoming misdemeanor and violation cases. Those are the two lowest level uh, cases that we have to go from 90,000 to 60 some thousand. That's a, about a 30% 30, 30 reduction roughly in the last four years of cases that we brought into the office like this. With the theft of services initiative, we believe we will get by the end of this year, the beginning of next, that number down to about 50,000. And as we rethink uh, whether we are going to divert
drug possession offenses as well at a much higher level. The goal is, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is where there's real opportunity for all prosecutors' offices, is our experience has shown that over the last four years, we can reduce significantly the number of these quality of life offenses coming into our court. There will be consequences, but they will, may not necessarily and should not necessarily be arrest and detention. And having done that in the last four years, Manhattan is safer. Manhattan is safer. Uh, and I like to think that having community-based diversion in our communities around Manhattan is making the families, the moms and dads in those, in those communities whose kids may have committed some misconduct but are not now getting arrested, but being able to do some diversion programming in the community, which then eliminates the case with no record whatsoever, I think they're probably thinking, you know, that makes sense. Uh, and I appreciate that there's a consequence, but that it's a consequence that may not affect uh, my son's ability to uh, get into college or his employment down the road. Now, let me say, first of all, uh, I'm not sure this works for everybody. Uh, and uh, I don't pretend that what we're doing is for everybody. But I can say that I have tried more than anything else to surround myself with really smart people and caring people in our office, with partners like John Jay, helping us to think how we are going to reimagine our justice system to make it safer, less punitive, and focus our energies on the most serious crimes. I had 400 cases when I was a young misdemeanor assistant at any one time. What that really means is you're doing triage. You're taking about a third of those cases and pushing them in a pile, and you can't pay any attention to them because one third is based upon serious uh, misdemeanors, domestic violence, and assault. And what happens then is these kids who've been arrested, uh, those cases end up withering on the vine. Maybe they get dismissed because they weren't prosecuted. But the point is, I want our assistants to be able to have the time to focus on the serious assistants. And I want the non-serious -seri cases, and I want the non-serious cases to be able to be handled uh, in a location that I think will provide better interventions, better outcomes, and I think as time has shown, keep us safe. So where we're going now uh, in the next several years is really to focus on not only expanding these diversion programs and funding them, but really thinking about how our office can help transform criminal justice in Manhattan and hopefully all broader uh, in, in significant ways. Uh, the monies that we brought in from these bank cases, which is the re result of very tough, long, hard investigations of big financial institutions all over the world uh, who were essentially hiding the money, movement of money through their institutions when that money was connected with either a, uh, a country that was on a list of countries that America could not business with or people who America had identified could not be doing business with America, sanctions violations. And our office was privileged as a result of that to have $800 million uh, by a statutory formula that came to us out of one of those cases. It's a really first, -hand first, uh, first a time in certainly my life where we could sit as an office and say, what do we think we really can make big differences on with these kinds of investments? Some of the investments was given to our fellow district attorney's offices to help them build cyber labs. Some of those investments were, were, were used to help fund citywide uh, the supervised release program so kids can be hopefully out of jail pending the resolution of a case. We gave $110 million to our housing, to our housing department, NYCHA. Why? Because 6% of our population lives in NYCHA, 25% of our violent crime occurs in NYCHA. NYCHA needed help. And we were able to, thankfully, and, and, and very happily, uh, commit $110 million to NYCHA to help them build in the 15 highest crime developments better lighting, layer, better layered access, uh, to getting into the, the buildings to protect the residents, and also video cameras uh, to essentially help us, if, if something bad did happen, uh, take care of it. We were able to make an investment in making New York safer by funding the purchase for the NYPD of smartphones for the entire NYPD. Uh, before the NYPD had been using their own flip phones, now they have devices uh, which are specially designed and with special software that enables a police officer on the street to essentially download and gain access to the information that's in the mainframe, mainframe computer in one police plaza. Why does that matter? It means that down the road, police officers are going to be able to take fingerprints on these phones to be able to know quickly who they're dealing with and whether this is a case that should be diverted because we know who this kid is. It's not a problem. To send pictures of real serious instance, if there's a lost child, 
if there's a terrorist uh, alert, uh, for the commissioner to be able to, in one press of the button, immediately speak to 36,000 uh, soldiers and, and officers that are out on the streets. Uh, it's an investment that I, I think is, uh, is going to pay great dividends to make our cops safer, but also be smarter on the street. We had the privilege uh, to be able to commit $40 million to fund the testing of backlog rape kits around the country. It's one of the real embarrassments of our modern criminal justice system that over the last decades, mostly women, but some men, have undergone after a sexual assault the grueling ordeal of having their body treated like a crime scene. And the investigators looking at uh, what other bi what biological evidence might be on the victim's body and storing in what's called a rape kit so that it could be tested later to determine if it had DNA that could identify who the attacker was. There are hundreds of thousands of rape kits all around the country that were sitting on shelves that were not tested for no good reason other than not enough money or not enough will. Now, I got to tell you, Karen Friedman Agnifilo, my chief assistant who's here, who brought this idea to me, Really, when I understood the problem, it really makes my blood boil, and I think it should make your blood boil. Because let me tell you, there is no other piece of evidence in the criminal justice system that is not tested that I know of other than a rape kit. When a gun is seized, it's immediately tested for operability. When drugs are seized, they're immediately tested to determine whether or not it's a controlled substance. But for some reason, and I think the reason is that America has a complicated relationship with crimes against women uh, and sex crimes against women that we didn't, as a country, uh, support financially those communities that had back backlog rape kits. And so we've done that now. And uh, it will end up in the testing of roughly 70,000 rape kits, uh, 23 states, 32 different localities. But the most amazing thing is what the statistics already show about how it's working of the kits that have been tested where biological material has been pulled and a DNA profile has been able to be identified. Karen, what are the numbers? Uh, I think in 50% of those kits where now we had a DNA profile, we could match it to someone in the United States in the National Data Bank who has a criminal record. So these are cases that have been sitting sometimes for decades. And when we finally got around to testing them, we could actually identify whose DNA it was, and often, 50% of the times, that was a man who was in prison or had been in prison. So we knew who he, who he was. Even more significant, 50% of that 50% were men with prior sex crime convictions. So this investment, which again was a phenomenal idea by, by someone other than myself, but using these funds has enabled us as an office to do a couple of things, to take on big issues. But the biggest thing that I want to end on is it really is about collaboration. Uh, it's about collaboration with our partners in the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution. So Mark from Texas comes up and shares with me how he's dealing with issues that are very relevant for me in Manhattan. And I'm learning, he's learning the way forward, particularly at a time when the government is moving off the playing field, cutting funding, uh, the White House is leaving us uh, uh, to solve our own problems. This is when, as a community, we have to come together. Uh, our future is going to be dependent on how closely we work with each other, how much we care for each other's well-being. Uh, and I'm just very pleased that our office, in, in its own way, through its efforts, is taking a path forward that I think is getting better results for the young men and women, particularly coming into our justice system, uh, achieving better criminal justice outcomes because crime is going down even with these policies. And on transformative measures, partnering with, uh, with communities uh, to invest in those communities. And $250 million will be invested over the next several years in Manhattan uh, to provide uh, for crime prevention programs in five different community hubs that we are building throughout Manhattan. Uh, why do we do that? Because the people in the neighborhoods want, they want the help, they need the support, they want it at the local level, and they want to be able to draw upon local providers to give it to them. So we're dealing with families that may be criminally justice involved. We're dealing with kids who may have trauma because one of their parents either has died or may be incarcerated. We're dealing with families that have a hard time managing, uh, managing simply getting by uh, economically uh, as a family and need someone to help them think that through and reorganize, uh, and reorganize how they're spending and living their lives. These youth hubs have all these services linked to them. Uh, and uh, the hubs themselves 
are going to be run by some of the most professional organizations in the country, if not the world. And so I'm convinced that these investments in our communities are, again, the path forward for prosecutors. The times when communities are alienated from prosecutors, those should be the old days. Uh, prosecutors need to understand what the community's thinking, whether it's on race, whether it's on any other legal issue, and we need to embrace it. We need to lead through it. We can't run away from the problems. We have to walk quickly to the problems. And so that's where I think prosecution is going. And I think if we stay that course, if we're honest uh, in, in understanding what is needed, uh, this conversation uh, about who are the prosecutors, what are they doing, are they really working with us and for us, I think that conversation is going to go in the right direction. Thank you all so much for letting me speak on this, and, I'm, and I turn it over to the real experts.